We're going to start a new series this new year. And the series is about, it's titled, the series is titled Beyond the Cross. What is the difference between Old Testament and New Testament? What happened after the cross? Many times we get confused as to the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. We all know we live in the New Testament. But many times in our lives, we still have Old Testament concepts in our mind. So we're going to discuss, I got many topics on this. Like for example, the way we pray is one topic. How do we pray? Some people, some of us still pray the Old Testament way. To whom we pray, how we pray. We're still praying the Old Testament way as David prayed, which is good. But we have a new covenant. We have a new and a better way of praying. So we're going to see that. Sabbath, what does Sabbath mean? What does Sabbath mean in the New Testament? God established a Sabbath in the Old. What does it mean for us in the New Testament? We're going to see that. Righteousness. Right standing with God. You're going to see that. Or access to God. How can we approach God? Can we approach God? How? Forgiveness of sin. Blessings based on performance or position. You know, these are differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, priesthood. Um, the laws on the tablet in the Old Testament and the laws in the heart in the New Testament. Works of grace and law. Are we, living, are we working by grace or law? Sin consciousness in the Old Testament and God conscious in the New Testament. So these are all differences we see in the, uh, in the Bible. And sometimes we think that these differences are a conflict. Many people have asked, the, you know, the Old Testament it says here like this, and the New Testament it says something different. How can it be? Is there a conflict between the Old and the New Testament? And a lot of times we have a doubt whether, you know, did God change his mind? God didn't change his mind. It is a new covenant that we have. So, for example, I'll give you an example. You've all heard this statement, right? The Lord heard my cry and answered my prayers, right? Yes? And we all use that, right? Is there something wrong in that? The Lord heard my cry and he answered my prayer. It's from Psalms chapter 6 verse 9. which says, the Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer, right? So sometimes we still pray like the Old Testament that is God. Did you hear me? You know, when you don't get answers like, God, are you there? Hello? <laughs> you know, we have the doubt. So sometimes we are still in the Old Testament concept of praying. But this year we're going to see in the weeks come ahead how different is the New Testament or what is it, what is it new that Jesus has established for us different from the Old. That doesn't mean God is not listening. In fact, God listens to us all the more. So we don't have to cry in distress. There's nothing wrong in crying. You can cry, but without crying also God will listen. It is faith. I think I said it once and it upset some people. It is faith that moves God, not the crying. And when I shared this sometime back, many sisters got upset because they are used to crying and praying, you know. So crying, yes, you can cry and pray, yes. But it is faith that moves God more than crying. Sometimes when you're crying, we really have got a faith. Maybe that's why it happens. But faith is what moves God. So there are many concepts like this which is different from the old and the new. It is not a conflict. It is a, uh, it is a, a new covenant which God has established for us. So the Old Testament is there for us to learn from. The New Testament is there for us to live from. The Old Testament is there for us not to live by. It is for us to learn about God, study about his principles, his values, and his relationship. So the Old Testament is for learning about God. The New Testament is for us to live from. So we have to live by, by the what is written in the New Testament. So how did this Old Testament get established? In the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, when Constantinople, the emperor, got together all the church leaders and bishops, they established certain things. One is about the sonship of Jesus Christ. That's something they established. And then it was about the canonization of the Bible. So these were the books of the Bible. Which was the right books? Because there were a lot of corrupt teachings coming up into the church. So when this emperor got together all the counts, all the bishops from different areas all together. It was a three year process. They sat together, they discussed, they argued, they contemplated and they brought together. And we have the Nicene Creed which has been which many churches, uh, uh, they, you know, they, they, uh, they, they kind of uh, 
they read that out nice and creed all the time in some churches. But this is something they all established because to avoid the wrong teachings coming inside. Along with that was the uh, canonization of what we call the 66 books of the Bible. So there was a bishop called An uh, Athanasius, Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria in Egypt. He was a very prominent figure. And this bishop was a bishop who basically canonized the New Testament for us, the 27 books in the way we have it now. He was the one who basically first canonized it. He is the one who wrote letters to the bishop in Rome about this. We find that in records. Along with that, this was a New Testament that we call, we still have the 27 books of New Testament. Along with that came the everybody decided we have to add the Old Testament because a lot of things what is written in the New Testament, you will not understand it until you have the Old Testament or the books in the Hebrew Bible. So they got together and they collected books of the Hebrew Bible. There's a small dispute between the Catholic Church or the Lutheran churches and they are Protestant. The Catholic churches at that time were following the Greek Septuagint translation of the Hebrew, which had more than the 39 books that we have which had the Tobit, the Maccabees, and all the other books, the apocryphal books that we call. That is part of the Septuagint. So they have accepted those books also as part of the Bible. But when the Reformation took place, they questioned that, and they went back to the 37 books, which is only there in the Hebrew, original Hebrew Bible. That was adopted. And that is how we have as the book of the Bible, the 66 books in the Bible that we hold in our hands. So this were all brought together uh, as the word of God that we, the council of Nicaea, they all got together. This is the word of God. No other teachings should come in other than what is there in this. That's how we got this book. So the Old Testament is there for a purpose. It is not for us to live by the Old Testament. We, need, we, can, we have to learn from the Old Testament, but we live by how the apostles lived, how the first century church, how they lived and practiced their life about the teachings of Jesus. So can I ask you a question? Where does New Testament start? The question is, where does New Testament start? When does New Testament start? If you look in the Bible, there is a division between the Old Testament and New Testament, right? Right after the book of uh, Malachi, and then you have the New Testament. It says starting of Matthew. But actually, the real New Testament doesn't start at Matthew. The real New Testament actually starts after the crucifixion of Jesus. Because the crucifixion of Jesus is what established the new covenant, the new relationship. So principle, in principle, the New Testament starts after the crucifixion. That is, anything after the crucifixion is the, what happened as what we call as a new covenant. Of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is the stories that build up, the, the, the history that builds up to this crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So... We need to understand the writings of what's written in the scriptures according to what, how it is planned. So, this Old Testament is there for our learning. New Testament is there to live. And we live by what the Acts of the Apostles did. So, frankly speaking, the Acts of Apostles would be probably the first book, if you call it, the starting point of the New Testament. And we can see how the early church did things, how they prayed, how they did. And Paul's teachings all adds up into this. So Jesus didn't come to Jesus didn't come to change or to destroy the old law. What he did is he came to fulfill it and start a new covenant. Everything what is there in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled it. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, 17 says, Don't think that I have come to I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus Christ, his whole purpose was to fulfill everything that the law has stated. That is his whole purpose. He, he fulfilled it and he started something new for us. It is not a contradiction. It is a new covenant which Jesus established for us. The Old Testament is, the Old Covenant is finished. It's fulfilled, established and the new is what Jesus has started. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 to 16. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 to 16. But now Jesus, a high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far, a far better covenant with God based on better promises. In the first covenant, if, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would 
have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with, the, with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is a new covenant I will make with my people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbor, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. So you see this Paul explains to the Hebrew church of how the old has been become obsolete now because Jesus already fulfilled everything what is in the old and he established something new. By his death, by the death of Jesus Christ, the old is established. So the, so the old... Old is removed because, not because God was wrong, not because uh, the laws were, uh, were, they had some fault. No, it's Paul says that the people couldn't keep it. The people of God, the people of God, the Israelites, couldn't keep the old covenant. They always faulted. It didn't work for them. So God said, I'm going to establish something new, something better than what I gave them before. And through Jesus, by his death on the cross, by his priesthood, he established something new for us. Amen. So you got, it, got the difference between old and new? The old is there, we can learn from it. We need to see how God worked and how God related to people, how the faith of certain men of God, how they did things. We have to learn from that. But we don't live by that because we live in a new covenant, a new, the period of grace. We are in the period of grace now. By the way, this period also is going to stop. This grace period is going to end. It's not forever. It's going to end. We are lucky, or not lucky, we are blessed, rather. We are blessed to be in the spirit of grace. And we're going to see in the weeks, what is this spirit of grace? What is this good news? The gospel, what is so good about this? What is so new about this? And that's what we're going to see in the weeks to come. How different, how blessed we are. How, how, how the good news, you know, what is so good about being and following Jesus and what he taught and what he established for us as a priest, as eternal priesthood. So, today's topic is on can I, which direction to turn to pray. Have you ever thought of that? Where should I turn to pray? Now, Merlin was praying here today, and she said after praying, she turned like this, right? You saw that. It always happens. Many people who come to pray here, they always turn this side. I wonder what is on this side. So, is there a particular side that we have to turn to pray? Is that what we, is that required? Is it better to pray like that in certain directions? And we see that in the Old Testament. Like, for example, a prominent prophet like Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, <clears throat> when, G when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, this is about that worshipping that statue, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper room, upper chamber, open towards Jer Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. Beautiful verse, right? We all know the story about Daniel, how he stands up for his faith. And the people see this and they catch him and put him in the den of lions and all that story. You know that. But if you take this principle of what Daniel did in the Old Testament and start making a doctrine out of it, this is what I would say how to pray. If I were to preach on how Daniel prayed, this is the points, five points how to pray. Number one, pray on the topmost floor of your house. Nice doctrine, correct? And there are some people who believe that there is an open gateway of heaven because there is no apartment above their house. There's only the roof. So they believe that I can, I have to pray to the... <laughs> there are many people, I've, the last day I... When visited somebody who was leaving from here and 
that I, can you bring a believer to take my house because I'm traveling for good? This house is blessed because it was on the topmost floor. He said, this is having an open gateway to heaven. Many prayers have been conducted here. There is an open gateway to heaven. And that was the topmost floor. So if you look at this Old Testament principle here, Daniel prayed on the topmost floor of his house. So we should all go to the topmost floor. Pastor, we are in the basement today. No hope for us. <laughs> we are even lower than the ground. So no hope for us. Looks like that. But this is the ultimate. Then, number two, pray with your windows open. <laughs> Daniel prayed with the windows open. So we should pray with the windows open so that the waves, the sound waves we pray will not be obstructed by the window or the walls, right? This is what Daniel did. Then number three, pray facing Jerusalem. That is exciting. Pray facing Jerusalem. Should we pray facing Jerusalem? Yes, we know that the Old Testament, they used to pray facing Jerusalem. But we need to know why they face Jerusalem also. Then number four, pray on your knees. Is that good? Praying on your knees is good. But Daniel, Daniel did that too. Pray on our knees. And then number five, pray three times a day. Daniel did that. So should we pray three times a day? Yeah. I think we should pray more than three times a day. Right? So, if we take the Old Testament, or if you are study only the Old Testament, we see certain principles, and, but we are not supposed to live by that. We are supposed to learn from that. We need to learn as to why Daniel faced Jerusalem, or why Daniel uh, prayed on the rooftop. The reason why he opened the windows towards, by the way, it says the windows were open towards Jerusalem. It doesn't say he faced Jerusalem. It said the windows were open towards Jerusalem. The reason why he did that is because he was building his faith because they were in Bab he was in Babylon at the time. He was building his faith as to opening the windows towards Jerusalem to believe and pray that one day he and all his people will go back to Jerusalem where they are supposed to be. That is a faith, a step of faith that he took to open towards Jerusalem to pray. But we also see in the scriptures that they did turn towards Jerusalem to pray. Like for example, and it was instituted by Solomon, King Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 35 to 39. 1 Kings 8, 35 to 39. It says like this. When, uh, when heaven is shut up, this is now Sa Solomon. He's dedicating the temple of God after he built the temple. He's dedicating it to God and he's praying to God and he's saying this to, the, to all the people in front of him. He said, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray towards this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you, when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon the land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land at their gates, where the plague, whatever sickness there is, whenever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by your, all your people Israel, each knowing the afflictions of his own heart and stretching out his hands towards this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive the act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. This is now Solomon's prayer as a wish to God. That God, when, because God definitely used Jerusalem as his place where he established his name. That is there. Because of that, Solomon is praying and asking God and telling God, if anybody sins, or if we have pestilence or war or whatever happens, if when people look up to Jerusalem or lift their hands towards Jerusalem or this temple or the house of God, let their prayers be answered. The concept again is here because the presence of God was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place or this temple was the place where God came down. He manifested his presence there in that place. And it was seen by all the people, the fire and the smoke and everything. It was seen by all of them. That God accepted this temple as his place to reside. So because of that, Sam, Solomon is praying and asking God, please, when people look around and look at this temple. And, and by the way, in the tabernacle before this, when the people used, when the Exodus, the tabernacle was always in the center. People were always camping all around it. So this was the center. So it was habitually, it was a, 
It was a way they had to look into this. And this was the place that God established for prayer at that time. Going on, 1 Kings 8, 44 and 45. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever you shall, uh, by whatever you, whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord towards the city that you have chosen, and the house that I have built for my name, then hear in heaven their prayer, and their plea, and maintain their cause. So this is all Solomon's prayer to God. God, please, when they turn towards the city and pray, when they lift their hands towards the holy temple and pray, God, please answer their prayers. So this was a concept that was in the Old Testament at that time, because God, His presence rested in Jerusalem. God has selected Jerusalem as a resting place for His name, to establish His name. So people all turn towards that. Even Jonah, for example, Jonah 2, 3, and 4. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. So this is how they had the feeling of they had to look towards the holy temple to pray. And then uh, they used to meet, not every time, they used to turn towards Jerusalem to pray. Exodus 34, 24 says like this, For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your bond borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. So if you were to pray towards Jerusalem, you are supposed to pray only three times a year. Or you are supposed to go to church only three times a year. <laughs> right? So, you can't take certain concepts of the Old Testament and just blindly follow it. There are good things in that. Learn from it. Learn from it. Why? Why was Jerusalem important? Why was it that people used to focus or turn their eyes towards Jerusalem? Because that was God's resting place. That was the God's resting place in the New Testament. But praise the Lord, after the crucifixion on the cross, what happened? The first thing that happened on the cross. The curtains, the veils were torn into two and split open. That was a sign that no more is God's presence resting in one place. Today for you and I, God's presence is where? In our hearts. Amen? Today God's presence is where? In our hearts. So that's what um, we, need to, we need to see. The New Testament, in, in fact, Jesus himself, Jesus himself, how did he pray? He looked up to heavens, Right? John chapter 17 verse 1. John chapter 17 verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes towards heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. So is it good now? The Old Testament, they used to face Jerusalem. Jesus, how did he pray? He looked always up to heaven. He always went to a mountain top to pray. So from tomorrow onwards, I'm going to go to the mountains of Kuwait, which is Mutla, and pray from there. I mean, there's nothing wrong in going to Mutla and pray. This is good. But my question, will not God hear you if you pray in your bedroom? Is there a definite, is there a particular place that is required by which you need to go? If God tells you to go through any high mountain, and it's good to pray in the mountaintop, because one of the good things is when you go pray in the mountaintop, you deafen up all the other sounds in the valleys. In the mountaintop, you don't hear anything much. The noise in the valley. So it's good to go up in the mountain to pray. If you want peace, mind, quietness. If your wife is screaming at you, go to the mountain top and pray. Sorry, not wife screaming. Okay, the other way around also. <laughs> okay. So Jesus used to go to the mountain top to pray. And it is good. That doesn't mean that Jesus or God will not hear you when you pray in the basement of a house or in your bedroom of your house. Funny thing is, have you ever seen that churches face east or west? Always. Have you noticed that? Maybe you haven't noticed that. If you study the Roman culture and Roman, the, 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 um, the, the, the way uh, architecture of the way churches were built at that time, it was actually in the time of uh, Constantinople when, he, when, he, when his mother, and mother became a Christian is when he decriminalized Christianity. Before that, being a Christian is a criminal, and people were tortured and killed. You know the stories about what in the history records all about Christians being persecuted and killed because they believed in Christ. But when Christian, Constantinople's mother became a believer, she started influencing Constant, the emperor Constantinople. At that time, he 
decriminalized Christianity or believing in Christ. So slowly they started, until then they used to meet in certain homes or certain caves. That's where they used to meet. So they started saying, okay, now that we are free to open, uh, to free to worship, let's meet in the bigger places. So they used to meet larger homes. We don't have, they didn't have place to meet. So as when Constantinople became a Christian and Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire at that time, there were these places called the basilicas. You know the forum, the forum, the forum which you see in many of the Roman countries or Roman territories. It's like a open columnade, uh, uh, open place, open market with a lot of columns that you can see in front of the Vatican. Not these pictures, in front of the Vatican you can see that too. A lot of columns there and this is called a forum. And this would be the place where they used to sell and buy things. It was a marketplace. It was a place where to do business. So everybody used to come to these places to do business. But as things progressed, because this place is so messy and everything, the elite people or people who were a little more highly business influential used to meet in places called the basilicas. Basilicas now we call as the old churches, but it was called basilica because it was again another meeting place, a market meeting place. The thing is that these basilicas, in those days they never had lights. They never had electricity. So they used to depend on natural lights. So the designers, the architects in those days, used to orient the church, or the, not the church, it was basilicas at that time, in particular directions so that the light would fall on the marketplace when they used to sell things. Like, for example, the center of the place where they used to keep things for auction and sell. The light at that time in the morning should fall at that place for people to see. So that is how it was. So when Christianity became a religion, or official religion of the Roman Empire, Constantinople decreed that all these basilicas can be turned to a meet, to be in a meeting place for the church. So that's how the basilicas became as Christian basilicas in the Roman Empire. So if you see some of those pictures I've put here, it shows you how the light comes into a place and it gets prominent to certain, certain locations. So the designers at that time, the architects, not like architects nowadays, who were very smart, they used to study the movement of light, the movement of the sun, the, the horizon and all that stuff, how light comes in which way. They used to position windows in that place. You know these stained glass curtain walls used to throw certain lights and colors around. This is all intentional for a purpose and a reason. So that the main focus will be on this. So these churches were basically designed for light in those days to be facing east and west. And then after some time, as things progressed, doctrines and things started coming to the place. Like for example, they started saying, when the priest is serving the mass, he should face east. Which means everybody is facing west. Then some churches, some later on, some said no. People should all face east, not west. Why should some face east? So this became conflict. Some churches have east, some churches have west. But the start of all this is because of the light. Because how to get light into this place. That is how it all started. But that became a, a, a ritual of how these principles started being taken out of context so that it became a ritual. So these uh, traditions started following up into this church. Do you know that this also happens even now? People still face East to pray. In Christian church, in mainline Christian church. That could be because of this verse. Some people claim it's for because of verse Matthew 24, 27. Matthew chapter 24, 27. It says what? For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So many people, if you ask them, why do you face east to pray? They will say on this verse. As lightning comes from the east. Also, they might say, it is because... The early church, they all faced east. But do you know that early church, the main church recorded in the scriptures, were all in the Roman, in the Asia Minor, the European area. The European area, if you face east, you actually will be facing Jerusalem. So they started taking this concept from the Old Testament and saying east is good because Jerusalem is on the east, let's face it. So as Christianity spread to the other regions of the world, everybody started facing east. So you see how the certain concepts came, started for certain purpose, but it ended up as different cultures. Even now, I remember once when I went, we went to a house to pray. And uh, 
we were not we went to a house to visit them actually so we went to visit them and finally towards the end after talking to them having coffee and all the stuff snacks and we said okay let's pray can we pray so suddenly everybody stands up to pray and everybody turns that side like i'm standing here and we stood up to pray and everybody turned that side i'm like what happened suddenly you know everybody stood up and turned that side hello i'm the one praying you know and i'm here they're all looking that side but in way that they had a concept of praying they still have a concept of praying towards the east or that's because it started by the early church facing towards east towards jerusalem again and even now i know of an achan of a priest uh, he comes to pray but the problem is this priest is his uh, gps gets confused all the time so you know how this priest is before they enter the house they finalize and see which is the east which is the west and then only they enter the house because when they start to pray they need to know which side to turn to pray because they have to pray only towards the east so this 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 achan has uh, a problem with his gps when he turns around when he goes around to the room and sits down he totally loses direction which is east which is west he doesn't know so his uh, kochamma his wife is very good at this gps direction so she notices so often it happened that when start to pray achan will stay here and the kochamma say <coughs> so the kochamma will turn the achan to the right direction <coughs> to pray this direction so they they were made to they made to fo- focus or look in certain directions to pray but is that needed the question is is that needed so in order for certain priests or to not have this confusion many people have a new culture now that is put the picture of jesus in the right direction in the house <laughs> so you put the jesus in the east on direction so that that's when he comes you'll know okay this is east now so pray towards that direction and now that has become a idol worship now we are praying to the image of jesus now see how things have developed it started for a certain purpose but it got transformed as times passed by it got changed so certain these kind of wrong teachings there's nothing wrong if you pray east and pray there's nothing wrong if you pray pay west pray turning west or north or south there's nothing wrong you can pray any direction because god is omnipotent if god is omnipotent and omnipresent everywhere then is there a need to pray towards east as christianity spread towards from asia minor towards uh, asia people all facing east can i ask you if you are in japan where will you face if you are in new zealand where will you face new zealand and japan are the eastest eastest part of in of the world you'll be facing west or east so is there a point is there a difference in praying east or west it's all the same it doesn't matter what happen what matters is more is that the presence of jesus is in our heart today if you are in india if you pray face east you are facing chennai if you are in kerala and facing east to pray you'll be facing chennai if you are in kuwait facing east you'll be facing iran correct <laughs> so is there a point some people say the son of god the the son is the son of god there is another teaching coming up the son s u n is the s o n of god so if the sun rises in the east so we'll turn to the east and pray that's another teaching coming up here so these are all teachings wrong teachings coming to church again going back to it certain things were started for a certain purpose but now things are being polluted but in the new testament we have to we have learned from all that let's turn to acts chapter 7 verse 44 to 50 acts 7 44 to 50 it says like this our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness just as he spoke to moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen our fathers in turn brought it in with joshua when they dis- when they disposed the nations that god drove out before our fathers so it was until the day of david this is talking about the tabernacle Uh, which was given as an example or a design or a pattern to moses uh, god told moses to build the tabernacle exactly as you see it god they made it and now they bring the tabernacle into the promised land our fathers in turn brought it in with joshua when they dispossessed the nations that god drove out before our fathers so it was until the days of david verse 46 who found favor in the sight of god and asked for a 
as to find a dwelling place for God of Jacob. Verse 47. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Think of it. Can God actually abide in a place made by hands? That is, this is now Stephanus. Before being executed, he's confessing this truth. He's saying this. Heaven and earth is all God's. It cannot contain the entire thing of God. God cannot be in a place made by hands. God, at that time in the Old Testament, showed, chose Jerusalem to manifest his presence from time to time. But the place could not hold him his completeness at all. It cannot be made by hand. But praise be to God, the New Testament is different. Galatians 2.20 Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? So now, where is God? Where is Jesus Christ? In me. Come on, everybody, put your hands on your chest. God lives in me. Amen? God lives in me. That is a great, that, this is a turn of the concept now. The Old Testament, it was in Jerusalem because God chose to rest his place. But in that same Jerusalem temple, after the crucifixion, the curtains were torn apart. And now the gospel is for anybody who believes. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you, the, the presence of God comes and lives in our heart. Amen? This is a great concept. You have to understand this on the bottom of your heart. So can I, let's put it this way. If, if God lives in our heart now, does it matter if I turn east or west and pray? It doesn't matter. It's the same because where is God? In our heart. If God lives in us, there's no, there's no, no, no so Merlin, you were okay if you prayed this way. Or, that is okay. You, you can pray any direction as the Lord leads. You can go up any floor. You can go to Burj Khalifa and pray also. Absolutely no problem. If you feel like going every day to Burj Khalifa to pray because they're the tallest building on earth, go pray, fine. But that doesn't mean that if you meet in the basement of Burj Khalifa, God will not hear you, which is one of the deepest place also. That doesn't mean God will not hear you. God does hear anybody, anywhere, wherever you go, because God lives in me. Amen? Where does God live? God lives in you and me. It's so much so important because when I see you, actually I'm supposed to see God living in you. Sometimes, of course, my character doesn't show that. That's a different thing. That makes us to think, am I really showing God's character in our workplaces, in our situations of life? Am I showing God's character? Because if God lives in me, then he should be living through me. Christ should live out through me. Does that happen? God lives in me. It's a few more verses. 2 Corinthians 13.5 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are in faith. Test yourself. Or do you not realize this about yourself? That Jesus Christ is in you. Do you not realize Jesus Christ is in you? This is a son of God. This is God's manifested presence. The same manifested presence which was here on earth 2000 years ago. The same God, the same presence lives inside of you. Come on, guys. Do you have a heavy heart? You know, when God so big lives inside a puny heart of yours or inside a puny living body of yours. How is that possible? This concept, I don't know. I don't know how God, omnipresent God, can live in me. I don't know how that works. But this is the New Testament concept. Where God chose now not to show his presence in a place called Jerusalem which he selected, which he loved, and it's still a special place. But he chose now you. He chose you, Sammy. He chose you, Jacob. He chose you and me to rest his presence in. 
to rest his spirit presence in. Now, this is something big for us. And this is what Christ established for us. And I want all of you to understand this concept. It doesn't matter which direction I pray. So, boys who are lazy to get up and kneel down and pray in your bed, it's okay to lie down and pray. Amen? Did your mom tell you to kneel down and pray? No? Mom tell you to stand and pray? Yes? Bible says you can lie down and pray also. No problem. <laughs> but only problem is when you lie down, you will sleep off. You will not say amen. That's the only problem. You can, you can pray to God in your workplace. You can pray to God. You can talk to God. You can relate to Him in your car. You can relate to Him in the toilet, which a lot of us do. You can relate to Him anywhere, wherever you go. When you're eating, when you're wherever. In the hospitals. It is not in a particular place. It is in us. Amen? Everybody say, God lives in me. God lives in me. Amen? I want you to understand this. God is not somewhere out there, far away. Oh, Jesus looked up to heavens. Yes, God, presence of heaven is towards heavens. Yes. At that time, it didn't live in anybody's heart. But when Jesus got crucified and after the resurrection now, after the Holy Spirit came down upon the church in visual form, on every one of the 120 disciples and on the many others, when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, he now resides in us. Amen? The Holy Spirit resides in us. So it doesn't matter. If you want to turn towards east and pray, pray. But don't make that a ritual. You can turn any direction and pray. There are some, some people that are so particular that when they sleep, the legs should not face Jerusalem. Because your legs should not face the holy city of God. There are people like that. There are, so, the, so people have brought in a lot of concepts. But today I want to tell you, God lives in us. Amen? God lives in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7 says like this. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So God lives in us. These jars of clay, these clay jars, holds the presence of God. Holds the presence of God. So let light shine out before us. Let light shine out from us. Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. Paul says like this. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through, the, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses, no, that, that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. So what basically Paul is saying here is, how God dwells in us, I don't know. Even Paul doesn't know that. But I, he's saying that I pray that each one of you will understand that the presence of God, with that presence of God, you will understand the fullness of God, the length and the breadth and the depth of the love of God. That's what he's saying. I pray this will happen to you. That you will understand the entirety of God by his presence dwelling in us. So every day, each one of our, our aim should be what? Our, ta our, our motto, our aim, our goal in life should be what? I want to know more of this God who lives in me. I want to know more of his love. I want to know more of his length and depth and breadth of his love, which abides in me. How can that love now flow out through me to people around me? How can that love flow out? That should be our aim. How can that happen? That's so important. And I want you to realize this. And I want to emphasize this again. Where does God live? God lives in us. Amen? God lives in us. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, God lives in you. God lives in you. Amen? Bro, you're not evil, bro. <laughs> Come on, tell your neighbor, bro, you're not evil. You are a holy temple of God. <laughs> so it makes sense. It makes sense to respect another believer. 
because that believer's body houses the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, if you remember, if you come to the altar with a gift, remember that you have something against your brother, what do you do? Keep the gift there, go to your brother, make patch up with him, then come and offer the gift. That's how important it is. I want to close with this verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus said how to pray. What did Jesus say how to pray? But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So where do you pray? In the, when you, this verse, secret means an unknown place, undisclosed place. Okay? Means unknown means it is, need not be a prominent place. It can be anywhere. It plays all by yourself in your room. If basement is the most secret place, go to the basement. That's what Jesus said. When you go and you want to talk to your father, you want to talk to God the Father, you can talk anywhere. But Jesus said, go to, the, go to your room. Just go to your room. <laughs> go to the place where nobody disturbs you. A place secret means nobody disturbs you basically. That's what it means. Go to a place where nobody disturbs you and pray to the Father. Because in those days, praying was how? You had to go to the temple. You had to, you know, wear certain kinds of dress. You have to bring certain kind of giving. You have to take bath. You have to dress up in a certain way. Go to a particular place. Turn to a particular direction and pray. That is how it was in the Old Testament. But now Jesus says, go to your room. And by the Holy Spirit living in us, it doesn't matter where you turn. So let's be careful of certain things how we do. I think I said this once. There was once a daughter who asked her mother, Mommy, why do you cut fish and fry? I think I told you before. Mommy, why do you cut fish like this and fry? So the mother looked at the daughter and said, uh, I don't know. You ask your grandmother. She used to do it like this. So I could also cut the fish. So the daughter went to the grandmother and asked, Grandma, why do you cut fish like this and fry? So the grandmother said, I don't know, honey. My grandmother used to cut fish like this and pray. So go ask your great-grandmother. So the daughter went to the great-grandmother and asked, Great-granny, William Uma, why do you cut fish like this to fry? And this William Uma said, Daughter, at that time, our frying pans were very small. The fish never used to fit fully. So we had to cut the fish to fry small. So the great-grandmother taught that to the grandmother. Grandmother taught to the mother. And mother is teaching the daughter to cut the fish. Why? Nobody knows why. Only the great-grandmother knew that you cut the fish because in those days, frying pans were very small. The full fish would not fit. So you had to cut the fish. So now today, if you want, you can fry the fish full. Today, the grills are so big, you can grill the fish. You can barbecue the fish. You can do different ways. So certain traditions and things have come about in our life, even in the Christian church, because of some certain beliefs. We need to go back to the roots. And the good news of the gospel today, I want to emphasize this. And in the weeks to come, we're going to see more about it. It's going to be fun. Actually, I started preparing on this, and God is giving me portions of it. You know, certain portions, certain topics. And I know there's going to be a lot more to be taught other than the 10 that I've showed you. There is more, so much in the scriptures. There's so much in the good news in the gospel that it recorded in scripture that, you know, I'm so excited. I'm so excited of this good news, the gospel. That is the gospel. That people are worried, you know, am I good enough to pray to God? I have the confidence that I can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? I have the confidence because he lives inside me. If he lives inside of me, it doesn't matter where I pray. It doesn't matter which direction I pray. It doesn't matter how I pray. Kneeling, yes, we see kneeling in the scriptures. The New Testament Acts of the Apostles, they all knelt and prayed. I know my cousins they live in a church. They, they are part of a church where they all kneel and pray, which is good. I like that. Kneeling and praying is good. But if your leg has a problem and you can't kneel and pray, it doesn't mean that without kneeling, God will not listen to you. No, God listens to you wherever. However, it doesn't matter which place. Because God lives in us. Amen? So where does God live? In us. Shall we stand? We'll close in prayer. Let's pray. You know, then, you know, you might ask a question. Why do you have to come to church? Good question, right? 
So don't worry, next week onwards, it's from home. <laughs> it's from Zoom. So don't worry, you don't have to come to church. But we come to church because of fellowship. We come to church because when we come together as a church, we represent the body of Christ. So it is good to come together because every time we gather, it forms the body of Christ. That's why we come together. We don't come together because in church only God hears a prayer. We don't come to church because a pastor only can pray to God properly and God will hear them. No, that is not the reason why we come to church to pray. We come to church because we represent the body of Christ. And anywhere we believers get together, that is the body of Christ. It represents the body of Christ, which is a blessing for the Father. When the Father looks down, he sees Jesus here. He sees Jesus where people get together. So we're not coming here because only here God will listen to our prayers. We're not coming here because the pastor's prayer is so powerful that God will listen. No, that is the wrong concept. Every one of our prayers, God hears. God is not deaf. Amen? So we come to church for a good news to show, to represent the body of Christ. And that is actually the communion, actually. The body of Christ. That is the communion. So let's be excited when we come together next. I want to come to church next time. It doesn't matter where. If the church faces east, fine, no problem. But I don't need to face east to pray. I can face anywhere to pray to the Father. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. We thank you for teaching us truths from the scriptures, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to each one of us. Holy Spirit, clear our doubts, Lord. Clear the doubts in our hearts, Lord. That we will be able to communicate with you, Lord. With the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for this beautiful fellowship that we have. Thank you for the comfort that you give us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you are a helper to help us talk to the Father. Thank you. Thank you for living in us. And help us, Lord, to show this good news. And this love that you have done for us on the cross. By the act of Jesus on the cross, today, you and I, each one of us can approach the Father boldly, anywhere, any direction. Thank you, because you live in us. And today, Father, as we gather together to praise you, to honor you, to glorify your name, we give you all the glory, Lord. Holy Spirit, we bless you. Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful privilege, and we go glorify your name. We give you all the glory. As we depart from here, Lord, we're going to take your presence, Lord, wherever we go, to our workplaces, to our schools, to our playground, to our homes. And we're going to bless you wherever we are. We can talk to you wherever we are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this beautiful time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.